She likes doing that. <laughs> Maybe you'll be a TV producer or a director. All right, uh, good evening, everyone. Could you turn your Bibles to Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 8? Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 8. Uh, we're going to be looking at verse 11 here of Zephaniah chapter 3, where uh, Zephaniah says that Israel will experience the forgiveness of sins, and this will be during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. And, we'll be ta and with regards to that, we'll be talking about the new covenant, which uh, gives the promise of forgiveness of sins. In fact, the church, uh, composed of both Jew and Gentile, male and female, slave and free man, uh, we benefit from the new covenant. Uh, because of our faith in Jesus Christ, we're engrafted in as the wild olive tree as Gentiles, and we benefit from the, new, uh, the, the blessings of the new covenant because uh, we've been engrafted into the olive tree uh, Israel. And of course, that doesn't mean, as Paul talks about in Romans 11, that doesn't mean you lose your racial identity because of that engrafting. And uh, Paul makes that clear in that chapter. So we'll actually be looking at that chapter, Romans 11, here this evening. So... Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, not only Zephaniah 3.11 here this evening, but also in regards to the New Covenant, Ezekiel 37 and 36, and also Jeremiah chapter 31, the big passage on the New Covenant. So that'll be our, our subject here this evening. And of course, this is all related to the, uh, the regeneration of the nation of Israel. And we'll also see there's a, a restoration of Israel. What I mean by restoration, a restoration to the land. After uh, the dispersion that, that we talked about last evening, the fourth dispersion throughout the world of the Jews, which will take place during the tribulation period, in particular the last three and a half years of the 70th week, which is called the tribulation, great tribulation period. And then they'll be brought back into the land with uh, Christ's second advent and millennial kingdom. And so this is a very important subject. So this uh, subject is telling us uh, that uh, the nation of Israel does have a future. The church is not the new uh, Israel, because the Israel that's descended from Jacob and his 12 sons uh, has a future. And of course, this is in regards to, this is on the basis of the four, uh, the unconditional promises in the four unconditional covenants to Israel, if you want to just say three, if you don't want to break out the, the, uh, the land promises from the Abrahamic covenant. You have the Abrahamic, Palestinian, uh, Davidic, and new covenants that all contain unconditional promises, meaning despite Israel's unfaithfulness, God will still fulfill these co covenants. And of course, he, is, he does that because he sets aside a, a, a certain amount of believers uh, for the, uh, the tribulation period and the millennial kingdom that will be believers in him. Uh, a certain remnant, a certain percentage of believers that will believe in him and trust in him in the nation of Israel, those who descended from Jacob and his 12 sons. So very, very exciting subject here. In fact, uh, verse 11 begins the se final section, really, of the book where we're just talking about the re regeneration and restoration of the nation of Israel. We're finished with the Gentiles. We talked about the Gentiles in Zephaniah 3, 8, 9, and 10, their future. So despite the dark language and the, ju the, uh, the, the, the announcement of judgment against Jew and Gentile throughout the first, uh, from Zephaniah 1, 2, all the way to Zephaniah 3, 7, now with verse 8, we have, uh, through the end of the book, we're, gonna, we're, we're talking about pro we're dealing with prophecies that speak of a uh, prophecies that are pertaining to uh, the f great future that God has planned for the nation of Israel and also all the Gentile peoples. So very, very important things that we're learning here in the Word of God. And uh, just again, I want to do the uh, announcer, uh, my, uh, the, um, the summer uh, break that we have every year. Uh, this year it's going to be August 1st to August 20th. August 1st to August 20th. And uh, we'll... Uh, Therefore, that means all the classes during that period are, are not, we won't have classes during that entire period. We'll, our last class will be Sunday, July 31st, and then we resume classes Sunday, August 21st. So uh, we're going to, uh, we're going to uh, take that break during that period of time. And also, we don't have, we're not going to have our prayer meeting at the end of class here this evening, and uh, we'll do it next Thursday. So, and also keep Titus in prayer. He's out in Virginia. And say a prayer that he doesn't have any problems with the weather. As Tyler says, he hopes it's not going to be too hot for him to fly back. I don't think they cancel the flights because it's too hot. Buddy, oh buddy. And uh, Cheyenne, you know, she misses daddy too. So she's going to go with me to pick him up tomorrow. So uh, they all miss you and I miss you, Titus, as well. <laughs> I do. What are, you talking, what are you laughing about, Jody? I do miss him. He's a bud. So anyway, he's a close friend. And uh, so uh, I don't know if he misses me. He probably said, oh, he's out there. He's like, oh, thank God. I got away from Bill for a week. 
But anyways, that's I have that effect on people. So, uh, so anyways, Jody, I can't believe you're laughing at that. Jeez. Anyways, and uh, we played a little trick on Jody before class because we, she has this big, huge Bible because she doesn't want to wear glasses, so she likes the big print. And I, we bought some, somebody bought her a net Bible, beautiful net Bible that has never been touched by her. But the lettering is so small, we just put a note to it today on, on the Bible saying, get a pair of glasses. And so, you, but anyways, she won't do it. Anyways, but uh, you got to watch out because Tyler's going to might uh, take one, use that Bible. His, your Bible's falling apart, isn't it? A little bit. A little bit the binding. It's a hot cover. I like the leather binding. They, they, we'll have to get you one for Christmas or something that. All right, let's uh, take a moment of silent prayer with those announcements out of the way. So uh, we take this moment of silent prayer to examine ourselves to see if we need to confess any sins to the Father. First John 1 John 1.9 teaches uh, that the confession of sin uh, restores us to fellowship with God. We maintain that fellowship by bringing our thoughts into obedience to the teaching of the Word of God, which is inspired by the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit, of course, speaks to us through the Scriptures. So when we're obeying the Holy Spirit, we're being influenced by Him, filled with the Spirit, as it's commanded of us in Ephesians 5.18. And simultaneously, we're letting the Word of Christ richly dwell in our soul. Colossians 3.16, a passage that we'll be studying in the not-too-distant future. In fact, I'll be working on that tomorrow and uh, this next uh, couple of days. So uh, if there's anything that's bothering you, do what Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7 say. I love that passage. And also uh, 1 Peter 5, 7. And uh, they both talk about instead of being anxious, pray and give thanks to God. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've so graciously given to us. We thank you, Father, for uh, this nice, hot, humid weather, better than the, uh, the uh, cold weather, Father, that's for sure. We thank you, Father, for whatever you give us. We thank you for your grace, your mercy, and your love. We thank you for your word and the gift of the Spirit. We pray that the Spirit would speak to all of us here this evening as individuals and as a, as a corporate unit. We thank you, Father, for Titus and Jody Thompson and their hospitality and opening up their home to us four days a week. And we just pray that you give uh, Titus uh, uh, traveling mercies tomorrow and a safe return tomorrow. We also uh, thank you for uh, Cheyenne's work with the sound and the recordings tonight and the technology. And we pray that you give her wisdom in that area. And we thank you not only for her service, but those taking advantage of the technology uh, as they listen in live right now through the website or at a later date through the recordings on the website. And we pray that we'd have, again, no problems with that technology. And we thank you for it. And we also uh, thank you for our union and identification with your son, Jesus Christ, Father, and giving us the victory over sin and Satan uh, through that union and identification. And also, it enables us to go boldly to your throne of grace. Your, your throne is now, a thr now is a throne of grace as a result of your son, Jesus Christ's death on the cross. Uh, which reconciled us to yourself and also propitiated you and also redeemed us out of the slave market of sin. So we thank you for this love that you demonstrated and the love your son has demonstrated toward us uh, when we were yet your enemies. And we pray, Father, we would reflect that love back toward you by being uh, obedient to you and dedicated and devoted to you and also reflected toward each other and uh, operating in the love of God toward each other, just as you have uh, exercised love toward us, with us being patient and kind and forgiving and tender-hearted with one another, praying for one another, uh, and, uh, as, and, uh, because, uh, and operating in this love because uh, you have loved us. So we know we are obligated to love each other because of the love you've demonstrated toward us and are demonstrating toward us now and will dem demonstrate toward us in the future. We pray that the Spirit would speak to each person here this evening in our study of Zephaniah 11, 311. We pray that the Spirit would speak to each person and help everybody understand, make application of what's being taught 
And please break down any barriers that sin and Satan would put up that, that would hinder that from happening. We pray that you would empower me to communicate your, first, your full counsel to your people so that this could take place and so that with one voice we could worship and praise you and thank, give thanks to you and draw closer to you in a more intimate fellowship with you and also your Son and the Spirit. So Father, we pray for this service in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's name, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. If you could look at Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 8, uh, verses 8, 9, and 10 deal with the, uh, the regeneration of the, the pr pr predictions, prophecies related to the, uh, not only the, the judgment of the Gentile nations during the tribulation periods, Daniel's 70th week, but uh, also their regeneration. And, uh, and now we get into verses 11. We begin tonight a study of verses 11 through the end of the book, and they're dealing with the, the, the national regeneration of the nation of Israel and restoration to the na of the nation of Israel. And uh, what I mean by regeneration and national regeneration, I mean that in contrast to the first advent of Jesus Christ, the majority of Jewish people will trust in Jesus Christ uh, at his second advent. Of course, there'll be a percentage, a remnant, that will be believed during the tribulation period, the 144,000 that we saw last evening in Revelation 7. But the promise is at the second advent, it's mentioned in Zechariah 12 and 14, uh, Romans 11, we'll see here this evening, and in Jeremiah 37, that the Jewish people as a whole, as a, and the majority of which, will trust in Jesus Christ at his second advent to deliver them from Satan, uh, Antichrist, the false prophet, and the tribulational armies which will have surrounded Israel at that time and uh, he's their only hope and they turned him finally and they uh, they trusted him and he delivers them in a mighty mighty way uh, the great will be the greatest moment in the history of the nation of Israel at that time and uh, we'll be witness to it because we're coming back with Christ for the deliverance of the nation of Israel the churches uh, if you read Revelation 19 1 through 7 uh, which precedes the description of the second advent of Christ and Revelation 19 11 to through uh, Revelation 20, verse 3, we see that the church is married in heaven. Then comes, then comes the, the events of the, the, the second advent of Christ, and the church is coming back with him, with the elect angels. So uh, we're, we're delivered from the wrath to come, the tribulation period. 1 Thessalonians 1, 10 and 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 teach this. And so uh, we can be encouraged by that. Uh, but uh, knowing these things, we should be motivated to evangelize people so they might avoid... Uh, this uh, terrible, most terrible time in all of human history uh, and, uh, through faith in Jesus Christ. So verses 11 through the end of the chapter in Zephaniah 3 are dealing with the national regeneration of Israel and also the restoration of Israel. When I use the word restoration in this context, I'm talking about God's going to restore the Jewish people to the land and he's not going to, they're never going to be removed from that land or dispersed from that land ever again. Uh, the Jewish people, unless they're born again and saved today, they don't know uh, what terrible things are coming to, ahead to them, uh, coming in the future to them. But they also don't know that the, their, their people have a glorious future planned in the Word of God. Many of them don't know this. But there's, uh, there's been three uh, dispersions in history of the Jewish people. The northern kingdom by the Assyrian invasions in this 8th century BC. The Babylonian invasions under Nebuchadnezzar in the 6th and 7th centuries BC. And then the Roman invasion in 70 AD all resulted in the Jewish people being dispersed. And, uh, and in fact, the Roman dispersion, uh, the dispersion as a result of the Roman invasion in 70 AD, didn't come to, the, to an end for the Jewish people until 1948. 1948 was a big year. And uh, so the United States was instrumental, uh, used by God, to bring that about, among, among, other, among the Brits as well. So we have here... We have here uh, one other dispersion left, as we saw last evening, during the 70th week of Daniel, and in particular the last three and a half years, uh, right immediately after the abomination of desolation and Antichrist deifying himself and the rebuilt Jewish temple. So as we saw in Daniel, it's an inside job. They are deceived by Antichrist. They don't know he's actually against them. He turns against them, and then war breaks out. We call the Armageddon campaign. Uh, described for us in Daniel 11, uh, and uh, Daniel 11, chapter uh, 11, verses 41 through 45, we studied, and uh, Revelation 16 mentions this Armageddon campaign, which is actually a three and a half year war. 
uh, and it ends with the second advent of Christ. And that final pitched battle, it'll be the Waterloo for uh, uh, Satan, or Antichrist there, excuse me. Uh, it'll be the final battle for him on this earth, and he'll lose to Jesus Christ uh, resoundingly. And so this, uh, the people, the Jewish people will be brought back to the land, those who survived the events of the tribulation period, like uh, regenerate Gentiles who trusted in Jesus, the Jewish people who were saved because of faith in Jesus, they'll be, uh, who survived the events of the tribulation period, they'll enter into the millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ, and they'll be the ones who repopulate the earth. And uh, again, also during that time, you have uh, believers, Old Testament believers, like Daniel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Moses, they're going to be in resurrection bodies at that time. They get their resurrection bodies after the church does. And so with the church and these Old Testament saints and the tribulational martyrs that we read about in Revelation 7, who will be in resurrection bodies, uh, they'll go and experience the millennial kingdom. So it's going to be the most fantastic time on planet Earth. And we're going to be talking a lot about the millennium uh, during this, the final stage of our study of Zephaniah chapter 3. So if you look at Zephaniah 3.8, it says, Therefore, and I'm reading from the New American Standard for those who are interested or wondering, Therefore, wait for me, declares the Lord, for the day when I rise up as a witness. Indeed, my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out on them my indignation, all my burning anger, for all the earth will be devoured by the fire of my zeal. As you can compare that gathering of the nations and kingdoms with Joel chapter 3, Revelation chapter 16. And uh, other places where God's saying he's going to gather the nations for the final war, the final Armageddon campaign. And this will take place during the last three and a half years of Daniel's 70th week. Then it says in verse 9, the result of all this, this uh, the God exercising his wrath, his righteous indignation against these Gentile nations during the tribulation period. He says, for then, at that time, as we've pointed out, I will give to the people's purified lips, the people speak of the Gentile nations of the tribulation period, and uh, the purified lips is a result of faith in Jesus Christ. Now, I must interject something here. Is every single Gentile and Jew going to be saved? During the, uh, 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 is this what he's talking about, these Gentiles? Every single, no. There are going to be some Gentiles. We know this from the sheep and goat passage in Matthew 25. There will be some P G Gentiles that will not be uh, for the, the, uh, the Jews. They will not trust in Jesus. And there'll be a small remnant of Jewish people who will not believe in Jesus. And we'll, we can see this in, uh, we'll see this in Ezekiel chapter 20. I Maybe mean, I'll throw, take you there tonight. Where God will pur purge the Jewish nation of the rebels in the nation. And it's going to be a small remnant. Uh, of course, because the majority are going to trust in Jesus and the nation of Israel at his second advent. So he says, for then I will give to the people's purified lips as a result of faith in Jesus, that all of them may call on the name of the Lord. They'll pray to him, worship him in prayer, to serve him shoulder to shoulder. And so, uh, we, as we pointed out last evening, that means... Uh, this, pr this prediction here is telling us that the, those who believe in Jesus as Savior, they don't lose their uh, racial identity. So if you're a Gentile, uh, it's true today in our day and age, in the church age, you don't lose your racial identity. Just like you don't lose your gender identity. You don't, you know, you don't become neutered, okay, when you be believe in Jesus. So we're going to see this in Colossians chapter 3. It says there's neither Jew nor Gentile, slave or free, male or female, all are equal in Christ. That means you have equal privilege, equal opportunity to execute the plan of God, to worship God. You have equal privilege, equal opportunity you're, uh, to experience victory over sin and Satan because of your identification with Christ. You're still, if you're a Gentile, you still remain a Gentile. If you're a Jew, you're a Jew. If you're a woman, you're a woman. If you're a man, you're a man. Whatever, you're a slave. For, you, can, you, can, you, you don't lose your identity racially. So that's very important because there's, as you heard me say, there are people in this area and around the world, and this is not new, it's been around for a while in the church, the Gentiles today who think because they believe in Jesus that they now become Jewish and they walk around with yarmulkes on their head and, and prayer shawls, Jewish prayer shawls and all kinds of stuff. And, and they're totally mistaken and uh, are, are, are misunderstanding of the scriptures. So then it says in verse, that's all, when I'm, when I'm flipping these things out there about that, 
a lot of times I'm having these people in mind because you never know some of them might be listening. So maybe we can help some of these people to get away from that false teaching that they're listening to. And it takes humility for someone to admit that they're wrong and get away from false teaching. Many people stay in false teaching uh, because of their pride. They, they don't want to admit that they were wrong. And uh, I'd rather be, admit I'm wrong than continue in, in error. Why, why would you want to do that? At the end of the day, you've got to please the Lord. Forget about what people think or your pride. So it says in verse 10, From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my worshipers, my dispersed ones, will bring my offerings. As we saw last evening, the dispersed ones are the 144,000 Jews of Revelation 7 and 14, those chapters, and they'll be dispersed throughout the world because of Antichrist persecution. And the Gentile nations will be evangelized by these Jews as we saw in Revelation 7 last evening. That's why I brought you there. And beautifully, they will be taking, as we saw with Isaiah 66, 19 and 20 last evening, they, these Gentile people who get saved because they're evangelized by these uh, born-again Jews, they'll take the Jews back to Israel, to Jesus in Jerusalem, as a grain offering, as an offering of thanksgiving for these, for these Jewish believers and evangelizing them and saving them. Uh, through the gospel, communicating the gospel. Then it says in verse 11, And that day you will feel no shame because of all your deeds by which you have rebelled against me. For then I will remove from your midst your proud, exalting ones, and you will never again be haughty on my holy mountain. Of course, he's speaking to the Jewish people. Keep reading because I want to read the rest of the chapter and because I want to read... I want to study verse 11 in its context. So verse 12 says, But I will leave among you a humble and lowly people, and they will take refuge in the name of the Lord. The remnant of Israel will do no wrong. That's the, the people he's describing in verse 13, uh, this uh, humble and lowly people. It's the remnant of Israel. So that's telling us the verse 11 is describing Jews as well. Because verse 11 uh, verse 12 is, is, is developing what's being said in verse 11 about the people being described in verse 11. So verse 13 is telling us, he's speaking of Jews in verses 12 and 11. The remnant of Israel will do no wrong and tell no lies, nor will a deceitful tongue be found in their mouths, for they will feed and lie down with no one to make them tremble. Shout for joy, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart. O daughter of Jerusalem, the Lord has taken away his judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. This is a prediction of Jesus Christ dwelling in the midst of the Jewish people during his millennial reign. You will fear no disaster. You'll fear disaster no more. Why? Because the king is in the middle of their, is in the midst of their nation. And that day, it will be said to Jerusalem, Do not be afraid, O Zion. Do not let your hands fall limp as they did during the tribulation period. The Lord your God is in your midst, a victorious warrior, because of, of what he did at the second advent. He will exalt over you with joy. He will be quiet in his love. He will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. I, will, I love that. He will rejoice over them with shouts of joy. And we'll be witness to that. I tell you, remember, we forget Jesus is not just God. He's man, and he has the emotions of a man, human being, like we do. And he's going to be so excited. He's been waiting for a long time for this to take place, you know. <laughs> He's been sitting at the right hand of God and controlling history, and he can't wait for this to take place. So as a man with emotions and who loves the Jewish people, this is going to be the highlight for him. So then, uh, uh, at that point. So then he goes on to say in verse 11, or verse 8, excuse me, 18. 11, 8, I'm not even in the ballpark, 18, verse 18, I will gather those who grieve about the appointed feast. They came from you, O Zion. The reproach of exile is a burden on them. Behold, I'm going to deal at that time with all your oppressors. I will save the lame and gather the outcast, and I will turn their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you in, even at the time when I gather you together. Indeed, I will give you renown and praise among the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. So if you notice in the book of Zephaniah, and this is true pretty much, I think, of every Old Testament book, anytime God talks about judgment and disciplining the nation of Israel, he always, always gives hope for the nation. Though he talks about judging and disciplining them, he always gives them hope of a bright future. And that's what we're seeing in the book of Zephaniah. He's talked about disciplining them, and he did, and he will. 
but he also has promised them a great future. And that uh, he, is, uh, he has set aside 7,000, won't bow the knee to Baal, meaning he's always set aside a remnant who will trust in him and the nation of Israel. So though many in Jew, the Jews in history and many Gentiles in history have rejected Jesus as Savior, we know that, we know that during the, uh, there's a future where it's going to be flip-flop during the millennial reign of Christ. Now, if you look at Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 11, we're going to uh, take this verse, uh, we're going to uh, uh, study this verse in, in uh, two nights, tonight and then next Tuesday. Uh, and uh, we have this evening, we're going to be studying the first part of the verse where it says that Israel will experience the forgiveness of sins. And this, of course, will be during the millennial reign of Christ. So, it says in verse 11, In that day you will feel no shame because of all your deeds by which you rebelled against me. And so that's the statement. Those are the statements we're going to look at this evening. And we'll take the rest of the verse uh, next week. So the phrase, in that day you will feel no shame. The word for day, remember, it's uh, in this particular passage, uh, in, in the book of Zephaniah, and this is true in Daniel, it can refer to a time period, a period of time, it could be indefinite or a certain definite period of time. Uh, it's determined by the context. Uh, sometimes it can be used of a 24-hour period as it does in Genesis chapter 1. So here, the, the context, it's speaking of a tw not a 24-hour period, but rather an indefinite period of time, which could range from a relatively short to a very long period of time. And here in context, because of what's it's being said in these verses that we just read, uh, and what we compare scripture with scripture with re relation to the promises of the millennial kingdom, the pro predictions, prophecies related to the millennial reign of Christ, we can see that this word day here is actually speaking of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. And through, in fact, for the rest of the book, when you see the phrase in that day, it's speaking of that p future period in history where Jesus Christ literally rules bodily in Ju Jerusalem over the earth for a thousand years, as mentioned in Revelation 20 and Zechariah 14 and other passages. Now, the articular form of this word is marking the distinctiveness of the millennial reign of the Messiah and its uniqueness in human history. Uh, right now, we, this is all we know. Mankind is not, know nothing but war, injustice, trouble, heartache, uh, uh, disappointment, suffering, anger, uh, you name it. This, this world is not, you come into this world and if you've been around this planet for a little while, you realize that there's, there's nothing but trouble on this earth. After, I'm not saying it's always bad, but it's filled with trouble. The world is filled with war and chaos and problems and difficulties, social problems, economic problems, problems militarily, nations uh, fighting each other and racial groups fighting each other, uh, the sexes fighting each other, men and women. Uh, there's all kinds of turmoil on this earth. Because why? We're all sinners by nature and practice. And there's a devil who's the god of this world, according to 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4, and he deceives the world. 1 John 5.19, Revelation 12.10. So therefore, that's why we're in the chaos that we're in on this planet. And this is why we have trouble. Now, even the man's environment, and this was given... Uh, when Adam fell, if you read Genesis 3, not only did he put a curse on Adam's bo uh, body, but also his environment. So, and so, therefore, uh, even the animal kingdom is upset by the fall of man. Because remember, man is the head of this crea the old creation, and the rest of the, the lower species suffer because of man. There's a principle taught throughout the scriptures. That's why Paul says that all the creation, in Romans 8, groans for the revealing of the sons of God, which will take place at the second advent. That's, that's what Paul says. Why? Because then the curse will be lifted from this earth. So then, during the millennial reign, you'll, because Jesus will be on the earth, Satan's in prison for a thousand years, with, a thousand years with his fallen angels, and Jesus Christ will rule the nations with a rod of iron. And if you uh, commit something worthy of capital punishment, you will be executed. Unlike in our world today, uh, very few nations practice capital punishment. And therefore, we have all kinds of problems with crime. We have no deterrent for murder and rape and things like these and, uh, and, uh, because we don't practice it. So that's all going to change the millennial reign. And so Christ will have established his authority because of the second advent, of course. Who's going to mess with him? And you get elect angels, the church, and resurrection bodies, Old Testament saints and resurrection bodies. 
and they're going to go through the millennial kingdom with those who survived, those regenerate people who survived the events of the tribulation period. So we see that this is going to be the most beautiful, you'll never recognize this planet. This planet will not look anything like it will during the millennial reign of Christ. In fact, the events of the tribulation period and all the judgments, the seven seal, bowl, and trumpet judgments, the second advent of Christ, that event is designed to reshape the earth, to redo it. And then there'll be, Christ will lift the curse because the, the creator will be in, in Jerusalem ruling. Israel will be head of the nations. Every, Jerusalem will be the capital city of the world. And the Jewish people will be the top celebrities in the world with, of course, their top celebrity being uh, the, the, the ultimate one being Jesus Christ himself, the greatest Jew. And so we're going to be witness to that. It'll be a, a perfect environment. There'll be, uh, there'll be no economic and political problems. In fact, overcomer believers in the church age, if you read Revelation 3, overcomer believers in the church age will be ruling some of the nations of the millennial reign. And that's, that's something to be, uh, motivate you to be faithful in time here as a believer. And you're going to have uh, righteousness and peace and truth. The whole earth will be filled with the knowledge of God. And, and Jesus Christ will be adored and worshipped and will be there to worship him. And all the nations will be worshipping him in Jerusalem. And you know what? That's not the case now. Jesus Christ is a swear word to some people. Jesus Christ is ridiculed. He's even doubted whether he ever even existed by certain people who were totally ignorant of history and the, the New Testament. And there, there, there'll be a rejection. There's a great rejection of the truth and the word of God, even in the church today, among his own people. But that's all going to be gone. The whole earth will be filled with the knowledge of God. Going to Bible class will be the most, will be the greatest, most exciting thing. Worshiping Jesus Christ, listening to him teach, it's going to be the greatest thing. But now, people are like, oh, bored to go to Bible class. You won't be bored during the millennial reign. And uh, we're going to be, this is what we have to look forward to. The curse will be lifted. There'll be no more storms. The animal kingdom, will, you won't be seeing a tiger, or a, a tiger or, or a lion chase down a gazelle or anything like that. Uh, you won't see that what you saw in animal kingdom. We used to watch when we were kids on Sundays, e afternoons or evenings. And uh, with Marlon Perkins, th that's all gone. The lion will lay down with the lamb. And so there'll be a perfect environment. The curse will be lifted. And this earth will go back to the way it was prior to the fall. So and that's because the king, God, Jesus Christ, will be on the earth. Now this word day, yom, it's the object of the preposition bay, which means during here in this context because it's functioning as a marker of an extensive time within a larger unit. Therefore, it denotes that during the millennial reign of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, Jerusalem, will feel no shame whatsoever because of all of her sinful deeds by which they rebelled against him. Now the word for you will feel shame, it's uh, the word bosh in the Hebrew, it's negated uh, by the negative particle lo. Now this word means to be ashamed because the word pertains to possessing a painful feeling and emotional distress as a result of having done something wrong with an associative meaning of having the disapproval of those around them. Now, in our day and age, even among the believers in the church, there's no shame for the things that they do, people do. They're not ashamed of that. They have no guilt or shame. It's like they have no, they have no fear of God. Uh, Paul talks about being, feeling a sh uh, church age believers feeling, asha feeling ashamed, in 1 Peter 4.16, feeling ashamed of their pre-conversion lifestyle as unbelievers. And, you know, I, I'm ashamed of the things I did when I was an unbeliever. I'm ashamed of some of the things I've done as a believer. And that's a healthy thing because it, it demonstrates that you are, uh, you are under, you're adopting God's view of sin. Now, does that mean you should be paralyzed by shame? No. You, try, you confess your sins as a believer. You're forgiven your sins. And so you move on. But if you're going to look at, your, look at your, your sin, you shouldn't be, uh, oh, I'm happy I did that. You should be ashamed of, of the things that you do, and you and I do. It's not, it, that demonstrates you have a, you have a, you're adopting God's view of what sin is. He hates it, and you should hate it. And you should, uh, and you, and, but you, again, you can't let it paralyze you. You've got to 
confess the sin and move on. Do what God says. And I don't want anybody going. I'm, you know, feeling ashamed 24 hours a day and uh, cro you know, drawing the shades and being paralyzed by guilt and shame. That's not what I'm talking about here. So we need, like in our country, a lot of people that just not ashamed of the things they say and they do. They do on Facebook or Twitter. The, th the way they act, the way they conduct themselves, their behavior. It's embarrassing. But some of these people, because they don't have truth, they rejected truth, they rejected God, and whether his revelation and creation or the, the gospel or the Bible, and they reject him, so therefore they don't feel any guilt or shame. Or they don't, they're, they're so uh, deceived by Satan's cosmic system that they don't have any shame for the things, sinful things that they do. The they, manifestation of, of the gay and lesbian thing that's going on in our, in our world today. Uh, they're so indoctrinated by the devil's world that it's okay. Every, ta every TV show now has some, a gay person on there, a lesbian in there, because they're trying to brainwash people, and this is okay. And so now you get a generation that's come up where when I was growing up, it was in the closet. Nobody was, you know, in fact, they were not, you would, if you were gay or lesbian, you wouldn't want to know it, let anybody know you were. Now, today, it, it doesn't matter. Everybody walks around and they don't care. There's no shame. It's not in the closet, we used to call it. You know why? Because they don't have any shame. They don't think there's anything wrong with that. Why? Because they've rejected God's word. They've rejected God. That's why. And that's a scary place for this country to be when there's no shame for the things that we say and do. And that, I'm not just talking about the, the gay or lesbian thing, but just watching politics or... You know, tell, different things on television, or the way people are, conduct themselves in society today, they, they, and they should be ashamed of the way they treat each other and the way they, they, uh, they abuse each other. And, and, and it's just, it's, it's, it, we're, we do so many things that are so shameful in this country, yet nobody's feeling any shame. And it's something to pray for for your country. Now, the second person, feminine singular form of this verb, is personifying the city of Jerusalem. And specifically, it refers to regenerate Jews living during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. So therefore, this verb, bosh, you will feel shame, speaks of the shame experienced by these regenerate Jews when they were unsaved, unregenerate, as a result of living a sinful life in relation to God who is holy. Now, the word's meaning, as I said earlier, is emphatically negated by the negative particle low, which in this context means never or no longer. Therefore, these two words indicate, bosh and lo, they indicate that Jer Jerusalem, and specifically the Jews in this city, will no longer be ashamed of their sinful deeds committed by them when they were unregenerate. Why? Because they'll receive the forgiveness of their sins, as we'll see, as promised under the new covenant. And how do they appropriate the forgiveness of their sins? Just like you and I did in the church age. We tr they trusted in Jesus as their Savior. Now, look at uh, Zephaniah 3.11 in my translation, please. Zephaniah 3.11, during that distinct and unique period in the future, you will no longer experience shame because of each and every one of your actions by which you rebelled against me. So, as I pointed out earlier in the evening, this verse is marking a change of topic. Uh, specifically, it's marking a change from prophetic announcements regarding the repentance of Gentiles in Zephaniah 3.8-10 to a prophetic announcement regarding the repentance of the Jews in Zephaniah chapter 3, 11 through 20. God, through the prophet Zephaniah, predicts that during, uh, that during that distinct and unique period of history in the future, Jerusalem will no longer experience shame because of their actions by which they rebelled against God. The second person feminine singular form of the two verbs in this passage are both personifying the city of Jerusalem and specifically it refers to regenerate Jews, born again Jews, who will live during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Now in this verse, as we pointed out, the word day in the New American Standard in most of your Bibles, the word yom, it actually means time period or period of time and it refers to the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. And how do we know this? Uh, I said it earlier in the evening, that's what it means. Now, what's my support for this? Well, that's why I read, had you read, uh, read the, uh, the context with me. First, this assertion in Zephaniah 3.11 speaks of the Jewish people experiencing the forgiveness of sins, and this will be the result of trusting in Jesus as Savior. Secondly, 
The scriptures teach that during the 70th week, 144,000 Jews from each of the 12 tribes of Israel will trust in Jesus Christ as Savior, and as a result, they'll be born again and saved, regenerated. Also, the scriptures teach that at the second advent of Christ, the majority of the nation of Israel, unlike the first advent of Christ, as we mentioned earlier, will trust in Jesus as their Savior. Consequently, the Lord will deliver Israel from Satan, Antichrist, and the tribulational armies surrounding her during those last three and a half years of the 70th week. Thirdly, the second prophetic assertion in verse 11, Zephaniah 3.11, states that the Lord will remove arrogant, rebellious Jews from Jerusalem so that the nation will no longer be arrogant toward him again. If you look at my translation of that particular verse again, and look, look at the last half of it that I just mentioned. It says, uh, he says, consequently, actually look at verse 11 again from the beginning, in my translation. During that distinct and unique period in the future, you will no longer experience shame because of each and every one of your actions by means of which you rebelled against me. Because, why will they, uh, they will no longer experience shame? Because I will cause the removal of your proud boasters from your midst. Now there's other passages like in Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Romans where the other reasons given why they'll no longer feel shame. Namely, they've received the forgiveness of their sins. Consequently, he says, you will absolutely never again cause yourself to enter into the state of being arrogant anymore on my holy mountain. Holy mountain referring to Mount Zion, uh, the Temple Mount area. So, uh, we see here that the scriptures teach that this will all, this would, what we just read about in Zephaniah 3.11 will take place after the second advent when Jesus Christ judges the Jews and orders elect angels to remove unregenerate Jews from the nation, leaving only born-again Jews to enter his millennial kingdom. Uh, hold your place. Look at Ezekiel chapter 20. Back it up a little bit. Before Daniel, you got Ezekiel. Look at Ezekiel chapter 20. And look at verse 36. Ezekiel 20, verse 36. So I'm giving you reasons as to why the word yom, day, in your Bibles in Zephaniah 3.11 is referring to the millennial reign of Christ. It says in Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 38, uh, 36, As I entered into judgment with your fathers in the wilderness, the Exodus generation, and of the land, and when I entered into your judgment with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so he's talking about the Exodus generation, so I will enter into judgment with you, declares the Lord God. I will make you pass under the rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant, and I will purge from you the rebels. When is he going to do this? At his second advent. I will purge from you the rebels, those Jews who reject Jesus, and those who transgress against me, I will bring them out of the land where they sojourn, but they will not enter the land of Israel. Thus you will know that I am the Lord. As for you, O house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, go serve everyone his idols, but later you will surely listen to me, and my holy name you will profane no longer with your gifts and with your idols. So there's the judgment of the nation of Israel uh, at, immediately after the second advent of Christ. So right after the second advent of Christ, there's two judgments. And it's of the judgments of the Jews first, and then the Gentiles, who've survived the tribulation period. All the unbelievers are taken off the earth, they're, put into, they're imprisoned in torments, and then they go to the lake of fire at the end of history, and the born-again Jews and Gentiles who trusted in Jesus during the tribulation period will enter into Christ's millennial kingdom and they'll be the ones that repopulate the earth, which, whose population will be totally decimated by the events of the tribulation period and the second advent. So go back to Zephaniah 3.11. So when I talk about the word uh, yom there, day, in your English Bibles in Zephaniah 3.11, which I translate actually uh, that distinct and unique period in the future, I'm speaking of the millennial reign of Christ. And what were the reasons we've given thus far? First of all, Zephaniah, the first assertion in Zephaniah 3.11, we told you, speaks of the Jewish people experiencing the forgiveness of sins, which is the result of trusting in Jesus as Savior. The second reason that Yom means, referring to the millennial reign of Christ, is that the scriptures teach that during the 70th week, 144,000 Jews from each of the 12 tribes of Israel will trust in Jesus as Savior, and as a result, be regenerated. We saw that in Revelation 7 last night. 
Also, the scriptures teach that at the second advent of Jesus Christ, the majority of the nation of Israel, unlike the first advent of Christ, will trust in Jesus as their Savior. That's taught in Romans chapter 11, verses 25 and to 27. Consequently, the Lord will deliver Israel from Satan, Antichrist, and the tribulational armies. The third reason why Yom in Zephaniah 3.11 is referring to the millennial reign is that the second prophetic assertion in Zephaniah 3.11, which we read, states that the Lord will remove arrogant, rebellious Jews from Jerusalem so that the nation will no longer be arrogant toward him again, leaving only the saved. Now, we also saw in Ezekiel 20, verses 36 to 38, that this passage teaches us that at the second advent, Jesus Christ will judge the Jews and he will order the elect angels to remove unregenerate Jews from the nation, leaving only regenerate Jews to enter his millennial kingdom. And fourthly, there's nothing in history or in past biblical history which corresponds to these two prophetic declarations in Zephaniah 3.11. So they must be referring to something yet future. So this now is not speaking of the second advent of Christ, uh, since Zechariah chapter 12, 9 through 14, predicts the nation of Israel will suffer shame and sorrow at the second advent because of their forefathers crucifying Jesus and rejecting him as their savior. Look at that passage. Hold your place. Look at Zechariah. Right after Zephaniah. And after, after Zephaniah's hair guy, and then you get Zechariah. Look at Zechariah chapter 12. Verse 9. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 9. I love this book. It's a great book. And in that day, I will set about to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. So the passages we've studied in Revelation 19 and 20, Zechariah 14, other passages... The Gospels, Jesus talks about this. He's talking about the second advent of Christ. I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace, he says, and of supplication, so that they will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. And why are they mourning for him? Because they're ashamed of what their forefathers did to Jesus, who they crucified. And they will weep bitterly over him. Like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. Why would they be weeping? Because they feel ashamed. They're they're, it's, they feel, I, we can't, I can't, we're the, our forefathers crucified this king, the Messiah. Then it says in verse 11, in that day, there'll be, great, there'll be a great uh, mourning in Jerusalem, like the mourning of Hadadrimen in the uh, plain of Megiddo. The land will mourn, every family by itself, the family of the house of David by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Nathan by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Levi by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the Shemites by itself, and their wives by themselves, and all the families that remain, every family by itself, and their wives by themselves. And that's why the second advent to Christ will come on the Day of Atonement. Because that's what the Day of Atonement is about. It'll be literally fulfilled the Day of Atonement at the second advent of Christ. So, there we have it. Now go back to Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 11. Those are the reasons. Those are the four major reasons I've given you why the word Yom in Zephaniah 3, 11, translated day by your English tra translations, is referring to the millennial reign of Christ, not the second advent of Christ. So therefore, this word is speaking of the millennial reign of Christ when regenerate Jews will be experiencing the forgiveness of sins in a relationship and a fellowship with the triune God. And this is the direct result of the nation of Israel trusting in Jesus as their Savior during the last three and a half years of the 70th week and at his second advent. The shame, which will no longer be experienced by these born-again Jews who will live during the millennium, is a reference to the shame they experienced as unbelievers or in their unregenerate state as a result of living a sinful life in relation to God who is holy. The reason for their experiencing this shame was, of course, their sinful actions. These actions are sinful because they were the means by which they rebelled against God. In their unregenerate state, and this is true of us too, us believers in the church age, these Jews openly defied the God of Israel and his holy standards by means of their sinful actions. They took part in a rebellion against God along with unregenerate Gentiles, which the scriptures teach 
is led by the devil himself, Satan. Therefore, this prophetic, this first prophetic declaration in Zephaniah 3.11 predicts that during a distinct and unique period of history in the future, the Jews will no longer experience shame because of each and every one of their actions by means of which they rebelled against God. And this is referring to the experience of the nation of Israel during the millennium because she has been regenerated through faith in Jesus Christ. Consequently, they will experience the forgiveness of sins was, which was promised to them under the new covenant as a result of their faith in Jesus Christ. So, let's take a look at a couple of passages. Look at uh, 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 Jeremiah chapter 31 first, which speaks of the new covenant. Look at Jeremiah, back it up. Go to Jeremiah before Ezekiel. Go to Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31. Um, maybe I'll start you a little early before that. Jeremiah chapter 31. Look at verse 27. Start there. Now, Israel, remember Romans chapter 9, 1 through 5, Paul said that the Jewish people received great privileges. And those privileges have not been taken away from them because of their unbelief as a, as a whole. As a majority, the majority of Jews have been unbelieving toward Jesus. They still have those pr privileges and prerogatives. One of them was the covenants. They had the, the covenants were given to them. And the covenants he's talking about is uh, the Abrahamic covenant, we studied in Genesis, and then there's the Palestinian covenant, which is actually the promise of land uh, that uh, they have which would go up to where Turkey is today, uh, all the way to the Euphrates River, to the uh, Mediterranean River, and all into northern Africa. That's all been pro that land has all been promised to Israel under the, the, the uh, Palestinian covenant, we call, call it, because actually the Palestinian covenant is a part of the Abrahamic covenant, but we break it out because it's related to land and the restoration of the nation of Israel, a promise that should be restored to the land. And then... You have the Davidic covenant, which is present, uh, predicts or uh, promises a descendant of David will be on the throne, uh, on his throne forever. And Jesus Christ fulfills that. Of course, he has an he has has that uh, he has that um, given to him, but he hasn't assumed the throne of David on planet Earth. Progressive dispensationalists think uh, that he's uh, already fulfilling this, but. To a certain extent he is, but he's actually not, has not assumed it on planet Earth because the Davidic throne is related to the, on planet Earth and, and, the, and the, uh, the Israel having a king over her during the millennial reign. And so it's related, that covenant is related to the Earth. So I, I believe progressive dispensationalists in that area are wrong. And uh, so then we, have, uh, then we have the new covenant. And, and so the new covenant makes promises uh, that uh, promise the forgiveness of sins and regeneration to them and the gift of the Spirit. So, uh, and these, un these covenants are all unconditional covenants, meaning despite Israel's failure in, in being faithful to God, God will remain faithful to her. So despite the fact that maybe generations of Jews have rejected him and not had faith in the Lord, God has set aside a remnant of believing Jews in every dispensation who will trust in him. And this new covenant is related to the future regeneration of Israel at the second advent of Christ and his subsequent millennial reign. And so this is yet going to be yet fulfilled future. We're benefiting, Jews and Gentiles in the church age are benefiting from this covenant because we receive the forgiveness of sins based upon the promises in this covenant. Gentiles have been engrafted in, as Paul says in Romans 11, onto the olive tree, wild olive tree, a contrary to nature, you don't do that, and emphasizing it's a miracle that we're engrafted in with Israel, the olive tree. And... We, uh, we're, we're engrafted in, and we benefit from the promises given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and David, and, and Jeremiah, and the New Covenant. And so, uh, but the Jews, as a the majority of Jews in the future, will benefit from this covenant, and receive the forgiveness of sins, and this covenant is based upon the death of Christ. Remember, Jesus says this in his, in his uh, when he goes, the night before he goes to the cross, and he institutes the Lord's Supper, he mentions the New Covenant. And so the New Covenant comes about because Jesus' death on the cross makes it possible for the promises of the new covenant to be extended to both Jew and Gentile. So it says in Jeremiah 31, 27, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man and with the seed of beast. And as I have watched over them, 
to pluck up, to break down, to overthrow, to destroy, and to bring disaster. So I will watch over them to build and to plant, declares the Lord. That will be during the millennial reign. In those days they will not say again, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. But everyone will die for his own iniquity. Each man who eats the sour grapes, his teeth will be set on edge. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Jeremiah was around, when Jeremiah was received this, uh, the, the, the Israel was in northern kingdom and southern kingdom. And of course, at that time, the northern kingdom was taken out with the Assyrian invasions. Then he says in verse 32, Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, that's the Mosaic law, the Mosaic covenant, which was conditional, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they will not teach again each man his neighbor, and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin, and I will, I, and I will, and their sin, I will remember no more. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day, and the fixed order of the moon, and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from, me, from before me, declares the Lord, then the offspring of Israel also will cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus says the Lord, if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out below, then I will also cast off all the offspring of Israel for all that they have done, declares the Lord. So there we have it, the new covenant. Look at Ezekiel chapter 37. The dry bones passage. Look at Ezekiel 37, verse 1. Actually, before you get to Ezekiel 37, look at Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36, verse 22. Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you went. I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. Then the nations, the Gentiles, will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord, when I prove myself holy among you in their sight. For I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you'll be clean. Speaking of their uh, getting saved. And I will cleanse you from all your filthiness, from all your idols. How will they do that? Through faith in him. Faith in Jesus. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. It's like we have as Christians in the church age. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of, a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you'll be careful to observe my ordinances. You will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers so you'll be my people and I will be your God. Moreover, I will save you from all your uncleanness and I will call for the grain and multiply it and I will not bring famine on you. I will multiply the fruit of the tree and the produce of the field so that you will not receive again the disgrace of famine among the nations. Then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good and you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. Sounds just like Zephaniah, doesn't it? Chapter 3, yeah. And I'm not doing this for your sake, declares the Lord. Let it be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded for your ways, O house of Israel. Sound familiar? Thus says the Lord, on the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will cause the cities to be inhabited and the waste places will be rebuilt. Waste places after the, the devastation of the tribulation period. The desolate land will be cultivated. Instead of being a desolation in the sight of everyone who passes by, they will say this desolate land has become like the Garden of Eden. And the waste, desolate, and ruined cities are fortified and inhabited. And then the nations that are left around you, about you, who survived the events of the tribulation period, that they will, you will know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt the ruined places and planted that which was desolate I, the Lord, have spoken and will do it. Now look at Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 1. 
great passage, the dry bone, dry bone passage, which promises Israel be regenerated. Verse 1, Ezekiel 37, 1. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the, the, Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. He caused me to pass among them round about, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. And again he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, that you may come to life, and I will put sinews on you, make flesh go back on you, cover you with skin, and put breath in you, that you may come alive, and you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone, and I looked, and behold, sinews were on them, and flesh grew, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain. And they come to, that they come to life. So I prophesied as I commanded, as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they came to life and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then the vision is explained. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is perished. We are completely cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God. Behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves, resurrection, my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel, restoration of the nation of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves and caused you to come up out of your graves, my people, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Moses, Daniel. I will put my spirit within you and you will come to life and I will place you on your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and done it, declares the Lord. The word of the Lord came again to me, saying, And you, son of man, take for yourself one stick and write on it, for Judah and for the sons of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick and write on it, for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and all the house of Israel, his companions. Then join them for yourself, join them for yourself one to another into one stick, that they may become one in your hand. Because at that time, when he was getting this revelation, uh, the house of Israel, or the nation of Israel, was divided, northern and southern kingdom. Of course, the northern kingdom was already taken out. Ezekiel and Jeremiah uh, both suffered from the Babylonian invasions. Verse, 17, uh, verse 18, when the sons of your people speak to you, saying, Will you not declare to us what you mean by these? Say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his companions, and I will put them with it, with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, one nation, and they will be one in my hand. The sticks on which you write will be in your hand before their eyes. Say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will take the sons of Israel from among the nations where they have gone, and I will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land on the mountain of Israel, mountains of Israel, and one king, Jesus, will be over them, and they will no longer be two nations, no longer be divided into two kingdoms, they will no longer defile themselves with their idols, or with their detestable things, or with any of their transgressions, but I will deliver them from all their dwelling places in which they have sinned, and they will cleanse them, and, and, and uh, they will be my people, and I will be their God. That's going to be fulfilled during the millennial reign. It's never been fulfilled in history. Because Israel has continued to hit sin against him. So then it says in verse 24, my servant David will be king over them. And they, that's, that's actually a reference to Jesus, the descendant of David. And they will all have one shepherd, and they will walk in my ordinances and keep my statutes and observe them. They will live on the land that I gave to Jacob, my servant, in which your fathers lived. And they will live on it, and they and their sons and their sons forever. And my servant David will be their prince forever. I will make a covenant of peace with them, the new covenant. And it will be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them. And will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. My dwelling place also will be with them. And I will be their God and they will be my people. Fulfilled, of course, during the millennial reign of Christ. And the nations will know that I am the Lord 
who sanctifies Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forever. Both Zephaniah 3, 11 through 20, and this passage are all speaking about the future regeneration and restoration of the nation of Israel. You can go back now to uh, actually go to Romans chapter 11. So, in Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 11, this verse is referring to the nation of Israel experiencing regeneration and the forgiveness of sins promised to them under the new covenant, which we read about, as a result of trusting in Jesus as their Savior. As we noted earlier, during the 70th week of Daniel, 144,000 Jews from each of the 12 tribes of Israel will trust in Jesus as Savior and as a result will be saved, regenerated. Also, the scriptures teach that at the second advent of Christ, the majority of the nation of Israel, in contrast to the first advent of Christ, will trust in Jesus as their Savior. Consequently, the Lord will deliver Israel from Satan, Antichrist, and the tribulational armies which will be surrounding her during the tribulation period. Also, they will experience regeneration and the forgiveness of sins. Joel 2.26 also predicts that the people of Israel and Jerusalem will never be put to shame again. As Isaiah 54.4 also predicts Israel one day in the future no longer experience shame for her sinful past. And the Apostle Paul in Romans 11, 25 through 27, he teaches the Roman church that the nation of Israel will experience a national regeneration and thus the forgiveness of their sins at the second advent of Christ. Look at Romans chapter 11, please. If you haven't turned there yet, like me. Romans chapter 11. Verse 25. Now Romans 9, 10, and 11 is basically Paul saying, vindicating God and his righteousness because uh, he's made God's, uh, Paul's made some uh, assertions about God in Romans 8 with the church. And nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, right? Very into Romans 8. Well, Paul picks up verses nine, chapters 9, 10, and 11. He starts talking about Israel anticipating the arguments of people saying, well, if that's the case, how can we know that God uh, will never, will, uh, uh, well, nothing will separate us from the love of God? But look at Israel. It looks like Israel has been abandoned by God. So Paul's saying, no, that's not the case. Israel is in this, the situation they're in because they didn't have faith in Jesus like you did. That's what got them in the predicament that they're in. Not that God was unrighteous. That's the whole purpose of Romans 9, 10, and 11. Very un misunderstood book. And I think that Satan's done a good job going after this section of Romans because he doesn't want people to know that God's going to fulfill his promises like we read about tonight to the nation of Israel. And uh, so it says in Romans eleven twenty five, Paul's talking to uh, the Roman church, which was composed primarily of Gentile believers. There were Jewish believers, but it was primarily uh, um, Gentile believers. And in chapter 11, he doesn't want, he's trying to teach them, don't get arrogant toward the Jewish people because of their rejection of Christ. Because if it wasn't for their rejection of Christ, you wouldn't get saved. You'll get, get the gospel because they rejected the gospel. And so God said to the apostles, go to the Jews. Uh, you, the Jews rejected you. Go to the Gentiles. Paul said that. Apostle of the Gentiles. And they used to infuriate the Jews because of that. And so Paul's basically saying, don't get arrogant because uh, that you are, you're saved. Don't get arrogant toward the Jewish people. And in other words, don't have, be anti-Semitic. And I think Satan, who's the, the uh, this is, if you look at history, church history, church history has been strewn with a lot of Christians who persecuted the Jewish people and were, um, and, uh, and practiced anti-Semitism toward them. The Christians actually did that. Of course, dispensationalists, dispensationalists comes along and with Darby and those guys and that's gone because dispensationalism says there's a future for Israel. A future national regeneration and restoration of the nation of Israel. And contrast to covenant theology which doesn't believe that. In, many, in, in some instances they believe there's going to be a regeneration some of them. Right? But they don't believe in a re, back in the land. They don't think that's going to happen. And so, the, this, bad, this, this misunderstanding of God's relationship to Israel and the future God's promised the nation of Israel because of the unconditional covenants he made to, with them, they, they've, 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 their bad interpretation has resulted in poor treatment of the Jews. 
We're talking about Christians. So Paul doesn't want that to happen. So that's why Satan, I said, is blinded ex Bible teaches through the centuries. Even a great man like Luther had very, who was very, uh, had, uh, and a lot of, at the end of his life, what he wrote was very anti-Semitic. Why? Because they didn't understand Romans 9, 10, and 11. So it says, in, in fact, I knew a pastor who a lot of people revere, and he skipped over these chapters. How the heck you do that? I suppose when you don't know what it means, maybe you, should, maybe you shouldn't talk, teach on it because you don't know what you're talking about. So I guess that's, that's smart, but why even take up the book? I don't know. So anyways, look at it says in Romans 11.25, with that out of the way. For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation. That a part, He's talking to Gentile Christians, remember that. That a partial hardening has happened to Israel. Why? Until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. Meaning the full number of Gentiles has been saved. So, all Israel will be saved. Not every single minute person, every single person, no. When he says all there again, it's the majority will be saved. Because we know from Ezekiel, there will be some that will rebel. A small remnant though. So he says, all Israel will be saved, just as it is written, the deliverer, Christ, will come from Zion, and he will remove, when he says Zion there, that's not talking about Jerusalem, he's coming from heaven. The throne room of God. Sometimes Zion is used for the throne room of God. And he'll remove ungodliness from Jacob. Just what we read in Ezekiel 20, 36-38. He'll purge the rebel, Jewish rebels, those who won't believe in him, out of the nation of Israel. Same thing we, you know, we, we see in Zephaniah. Then he says in verse 27, This is my covenant with them, the new covenant, when I take away their sins. So from the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, you Gentiles, but from the standpoint of God's choice, they're beloved for the sake of the fathers. The promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and David, and, and Jeremiah. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. irrevocable. A lot of times we use this passage and, you know, um, and, and we, don't, we, we forget about the context in which it's found. So, there we have uh, God's uh, future of the nation of Israel, he's predicting, that they'll be regenerated. Very, very important. So, as we close here, like Zephaniah 3.11, Romans 11.26, as we just read, speaks of God removing unrepentant, unregenerate Jews at his second advent. As we noted earlier, the nation of Israel will experience the forgiveness of sins during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ as a result of their faith in Jesus during the tribulation and second advent, which was promised to them, these forgiveness of sins was promised to them, as we noted earlier, under the new covenant given to Jeremiah. And one of the unconditional promises of the new covenant, as we read in Jeremiah 31, 34, is the forgiveness of sins. And us Gentiles in the church age, we're benefiting from that promise in the, in the new covenant. We've been engrafted into the olive tree. We're the wild olive tree for Romans 11. Gentiles. And, we were, and Paul says, it's engrafted contrary to nature. And the olive tree is Israel. And everybody who's on that olive tree, every branch on that tree of is, uh, olive tree, Israel, is saved, Jews. And so we've been engrafted in as Gentiles, the wild olive tree. And because of that, we benefit from this promise, the promises to given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the, the, the four unconditional covenants given to Israel. The church, uh, Gentile believers in the church age benefit along with Jewish believers with the, uh, from this covenant as a result of their faith in Jesus Christ. So, uh, as we wrap this study up, what is this, what should we, what should we derive from this study? Make an application. With a lot of t reading a lot of things about um, nation of Israel, but how does this apply to, the ch how does it apply to us here in the church age? Well, to the Jew first and then to the Greek. Pray for your Jew, your fellow, uh, your, your, those who are Jews that you know. Pray for the Jewish people all around the world. Pray that God will bring in whatever circumstances, people, blessings, adversity, prosperity necessary to cause them to see their need for Jesus. And maybe we can save some of them from the tribulation period and the lake of fire. So the Jewish people have a future. And what else have we learned? God can be counted on. He keeps his promises. This is what we're reading about. Paul, this is what Paul is trying to tell the, the Gentile Christians in the Roman church. God's faithfulness to Israel should be an encouragement to you. If he's faithful to Israel, he'll be faithful to you. Who are far away from God, you Gentiles. 
but now you've been brought near by the blood of Christ, as he says in Ephesians 2. So we should, uh, and we should also be thankful and appreciative of what God did through the nation of Israel. Their rejection of Jesus during the first advent, as Paul says in Romans 11, resulted in the gospel going to the Gentiles. And we benefited from that. So we owe a lot to the Jewish people. We're benefiting the, un the four, un four unconditional covenants. The Messiah is a Jew. Uh, all these things, again, the Shekinah glory, Jesus Christ is a Jew. Salvation is of the Jews. Your Bible is written by Jewish men under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We owe everything to the, a lot of things to the Jewish people. In effect, we could say we owe everything to them. Our heritage is Jewish. So we're Gentiles. What I mean by that is the Bible is Jewish. It's, it's a, our God is Jewish. Jesus is a Jew. Now, I don't want you to, Jesus doesn't want you to walk around with a yarmulke tomorrow. You know, the little thing on the head and everything, or a prayer shawl or something. You know, and you know, starting talking uh, Yiddish. You don't even know what that is, right? And uh, no, he, but he wants you to have appreciation of the Jewish people and also. Uh, he also wants us to take this information and apply it in our lives. God is faithful to unfaithful Israel. He'll be faithful, and he's going to keep these promises to Israel in the future. And look at he's done. He'll be faithful to us. Nothing will ever separate us from the love of God because God is faithful to his promises. So let's close in prayer. We'll, we'll pick this up Sunday, and we'll resume our study in Zephaniah next Tuesday, of course. And, of course, this Sunday we resume our study and uh, Colossians. So let's close in prayer. Remember, there's no prayer meeting tonight. Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We thank you for everyone here this evening. We pray that the Spirit would speak to each person as an individual and as a corporate unit. And our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.